Thank you very much. Much appreciated. So thanks everyone for joining. Uh, this is the latest edition of the Presos Collective Book Club, where we have uh, a very honoured guest, uh, Mr. Bob Riefstahl, uh, who is going to uh, take our questions about the excellent book, Demonstrating to Win, that obviously we have been uh, talking about over the last few months. Um, so thanks for everyone who has uh, come back <laughs> from our previous discussions, and thanks to all those people who are, who are new. Um, I hopefully it's going to be a really good session. Uh, obviously, with us on the call today is, is Bob. I will let him, of course, introduce himself, but uh, probably needs no introduction by now. Author, speaker, and founder of Two Win Global. Uh, yeah, Bob, thank you very much for joining us. Nice to have you here. That's my honor. It's kind awesome. Of very, very humbling that you would do a book club on my book. So it's that's. Uh... <laughs> Well, yeah, we do it. We do a mixture of uh, pre-sales specific books and mm -hmm. also kind of general interest uh, business books. Um, so we will actually at the end of this session announce what our next book is going to be for those of you who are interested. But I think uh, for now, what I'll do is uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. So we'll have, a nice, have a nice gallery view. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping. If you are uh, yeah, not speaking, if you can mute yourself. And then because there's quite a few people, uh, what I thought we'd do for the Q&A is if you could uh, try to use the hands up feature uh, in, in Zoom. Uh, first of all, you've got to find that, which is classic. So you click on reactions and then you can click on raise hand. Uh, and then hopefully I'll, I'll call you out sort of uh, one by one or Steve and I will call you out one by one uh, in order to do that. Hopefully that works fine. If not, we'll resort to chat, but I'd like to get some people involved so you can actually ask questions live. Um, so without further ado, uh, Bob, so David, I have, yeah, yeah would, sorry, go ahead, Bob. Um, would, it, would you have any interest in a little bit of background of how I went about writing the book or why I even did it? That would be, that would be awesome. Uh, that was actually my final question to you was sort of, like, <laughs> okay. how do we, but we'll start at the end. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll start at the end as so many good demos do. Uh, yeah, that would be fantastic if you give a bit of background. Yeah, so um, I had been, uh, I came into my career um, out of university. I came on, into my career working for a, a real large computer company at the time called Burroughs, which became Unisys. And that was in the days where you sold the computer and the, the software was just something that helped you sell the computer. But it was all about selling the computer. You know? So... Um, I went to this, this training class I had in Pennsylvania on how to do a demo of the computer and um, was fascinated by it. And so as a salesperson, even though the demos were pretty technical back then, I liked doing my own demos. And so I kind of made a career early on in, in my sales career of always doing my own demos. I ended up working for an ERP um, a company called Next Trend, which was acquired by uh, by um, Infor, and had some pretty good success there, um, and built a region out of Atlanta. And um, they asked me to take on the role of VP of Sales in Colorado Springs. So I moved the family; they were little kids at the time. And I went out to Colorado Springs, and I started going to all of our demos, major demos. You know, you can't go to all of them, obviously, um, uh, but I went to the major demos and it, it, it was just, it was killing me. Like I was watching these demos. I mean, our people were really smart and it, the software was a ERP for wholesale distributors. So, you know, taking orders and doing the accounting and the inventory, that type of thing. And they were really smart and they were really knowledgeable about the industry, but they always went in the weeds. You know, they always talked about the features and the features and the features and they were killing the room. And so, I decided I needed to, to train the team, you know, the, the greater team on how to do a better demo, but I couldn't really find a very good training class. So I wrote one. Uh, and I, if you know much about salespeople and you guys too, uh, we're not exactly curriculum people, you know, like <laughs> put a bunch of slides together and sort of had some fun with it. And I showed them the right ways and the wrong ways. And that that's what sort of spawned the whole idea of demo crimes, right? Don't do this. And I ended up writing the book 
is really a hobby um, on airplanes. When I was flying place to place, I would just, you know, pull up in the laptop and just start writing, which was perfect because it was like an hour and a half at a time. And then I decided to make the leap 20 years ago. Um, so we celebrated 20 years in March. And um, my first big clients when I made the leap, you know, I didn't know if this was going to fly or not. I mean, it's you know, sort of a chance um, was J.D. Edwards. And I got Microsoft in early. I got into Oracle early just by doing some speeches and whatnot in the book. And then we've built the business from there. So um, we now have around 50 people total, including um, fine facilitators like Ed Jaffe is one of ours. Um, he, he, he does coaching with us. And uh, that's kind of how the whole, whole book started. I would tell you that the, the crime file chapter was very introspective. So it, it wasn't me being uber critical of everybody on the team and all the mistakes they made. It was more of these were all the mistakes I know I made in demos. And boy, I sure remember the bad stuff that happened when I did it, <laughs> uh, the bad outcomes. So that's sort of the background on, on the whole book in the, in the firm. That was a long background. I'm sorry for that. No, that's great. And I think it's very interesting that the demo crimes chapter was introspective because I think certainly what I found when I read it is that it was quite introspective for myself. Like I could see the mistakes that I made in the chapter all the time. And I think that's a common thing that people feel probably. Um, so I, you know, I'll, I'll kick off with kind of the first question, which is that obviously, you know, you talk about how the book was made, you know, the first edition was over 20 years ago. And I guess the world looked extremely different back then. Like you said, <laughs> you know, it was uh, selling a whole different, uh, a whole different thing. Um, but what was interesting to me when I read the book is that some of the things and some of the lessons are just fundamental throughout. Right. Um, so I would be really interested to know if you started writing the book again today, what kind of material in the book would you keep and what would you change or how would you do it differently? Uh, yeah. So what would I do different um, or how, how might I, Put different emphasis in the book, I suppose, is probably in some ways what you're asking. Um, most certainly, when I wrote the book originally, and, and there's been a revision of it, um, and I'm this fall we'll be writing another revision. So your your question is quite timely because uh, <laughs> um, that will there will be a fair amount of rewrite. Um, when I wrote the book, the demos that I had experience in, for the most part were pretty deep, you know, multi-hour, sometimes multi-day, um, real in-depth stuff. It wasn't SaaS style, uh, online, uh, a Zoom demo that's 45 minutes long or an hour long, that type of thing. Um, the other thing that was different back then was the power of no was pretty powerful in the sense that if the client didn't allow us to have pretty deep discovery, you know, reasonably deep discovery, we would just say, it's going to be, it's going to be really difficult to do this demo. Your people aren't going to, going to um, appreciate the flow of the software unless we know your use cases. So I think we're going to pass. And then they'd go, oh, no, no, you can come talk to us. You know, you, you, we used to be able to do that. Um, that's hard to do anymore. Um, I have a theory about that, but um, so part of, a big part of the change would have everything to do with agility. Mm. Uh, all of us get thrust into situations, um, all of our clients do, where there's very little discovery or there's discovery, but it's what we refer to as underknown discovery. Like you got to talk to a sponsor, but you didn't really talk to all the different people that are going to be on the call. You don't have time to anyway. You know, like you're, you're, most people are going session to session to session and to be able to do lots and lots of interviews is really difficult um so a lot of a lot of us get surprised um and how do you handle situations where they say well how do you do this show me this and you didn't really have any you don't have any context so i think um i'll put a lot more emphasis on the techniques the, the things you can do 
from an agility perspective when you get faced with those kind of situations? Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, because I, I think that's sort of the norm now uh, is yeah. that, you know, you need, you need to be more agile and you don't get to meet all the sponsors, obviously in an ideal world, <laughs> you do as much discovery as possible, but that would, that is a key thing. I think these days is the agility. Um, you know, David, it, it kind of tickles me to, to read, you know, different articles and blogs um, that are posted by, you know, some, some, some real fine writers. I'm not saying that they, the people aren't, but where they'll, they'll, you know, kind of boldly say, eh, if I don't get discovery, I should, you know, um, if tell them, no, you know, you, you tell the AE, forget it. I'm you know, tell the client, no. And it's, it's like, yeah, in theory, you can try that. But whether the AE would go back and really work for you to try and get, get you some additional context discovery has everything to do with the mathematical formula of how much do they have in their pipeline and where are they year to date versus, you know what I mean? Like there's, a, there's that desperation factor that they all have. And look, I've been there. I've lived it. You know, you're, it's coming up on the end of the quarter. You're behind and you're flipping out and you're trying to do anything you can to get some business in in the quarter. And you're thinking, well, let's just try a demo. Let, let, let's demo to them again. And, you know, it happens. So instead of, instead of just saying at, there's an absolute here, how about we skill up and, you know, I don't want to enable bad habits, but you've got your reality, you know? So let, how can I best arm you for the reality? Mm, that's totally true. That's definitely, definitely true. <laughs> in my, in my role, at least anyway, uh, definitely. Okay. Anyone, uh, questions from the floor? Anyone or comments on that? I, I'd be real or curious comments on that. that. Yeah, yeah. How people feel about that. Go ahead. Eric, Eric is the first one to find the hands up button. Well done, Eric. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Uh, yeah, just a, a comment on that, just in terms of, it is based on the, the numerical calculation of where are you in year today? Where are you on the pipeline? I think it's also being afraid of upsetting the customer with the number of meetings before they actually get to the demonstration. Because if you're in a traditional sales cycle, you have the BDR that's reaching out initially for the lead that came in, the introduction then to the AE, the AE doing a qualification, then having the discovery call and then actually doing a demonstration before you actually get to see the product. You're now in meeting number four, meeting number five versus, hey, let's just go and throw the spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks approach. So it's, I think it's kind of both for, let's be able to understand what they're trying to accomplish, but let's also be able to show them what our product is about. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the other balancing factor in that that's obviously crucial is uh, what is the prospect demanding? You know, like they self-educated and they're like, look, just show me something here. I already, I know what I need. I need the software to do. At least I think I do. Um, here's my punch list or I'll give it to you in the demo. Just, can we, can we get to it? Can we, can you show me something? You know, that they get a little impatient um, and we all do. I mean, don't we, we, we all find that in our personal lives when we're buying things. We're like, let's well, show it to me. <laughs> Madeline, you had your hand up. Yeah, so kind of going off of David's question a little bit um, with the writing of the new revision, uh, would you be adding more or new demo crimes in like to fit this Zoom world that we're in? Is that something that if you had to do it, what would you be adding? Absolutely. We did a, um, um, we did a, an entire course on right, right at the pandemic. Uh, we were actually really well prepared for the pandemic. Um, and we went ahead and did a, a, a course on being successful working from home. Um, and, it, it, and Chad, my VP of curriculum, put it together pretty quickly. But he, you know, it was, it was a culmination of everything that, that we had been doing of how to maximize your effectiveness in something like Zoom, right, in virtual meetings. And he also hits on, you know, like mindset and, you know, working from home, all, all the things that people were struggling with initially anyway. Um, so we would, I would definitely put, I put some in there for virtual, but we will, we'll, 
we'll put more in there on, on virtual and demo crimes around that. Also some storytelling crimes. Um, we, we've, we've got a real successful course. It's been on fire uh, with clients on storytelling. And there's a lot of storytelling courses out there. Uh, we took a little bit of a different angle on it of being real tactical and practical, in particular if you're in pre-sales or sales in tech, of how to use storytelling in a lot of different venues, you know, so in situations. So people think of storytelling as sort of these, it's how an AE opens up, you know, and presents the value or it's some long thing. And it's and, and it can be a, as short as you're getting ready to, to demo a demo topic. How do you tell a little story that draws them into the topic that sets the context? Sort of that, here's the situation, you know, you find your, one of the things I learned about you is you find yourself today and this is, you know, and you tell a little story that opens up the topic, makes it a lot more sticky when you show it. So demo crimes for storytelling, for uh, virtual, um, well, I'll probably put some more in there for AEs too. I don't want to bury people in demo crimes. It's like, I don't want to, <laughs> I hate coming off condescending. Like, I don't like condescending people. Um, and so I don't want it to be that. And I'll never put a demo crime in that I don't have the other side of it, which, which is, and here's what you do about it. Like, you know, here, here's the, cor the correcting fundamental or technique. So the, I, I'm curious, um, raise your hand if when you read the demo crimes like David, you cringed a little bit or you, you, you got a little bit introspective and it was a little uncomfortable. Like you saw yourself in some of them anyway. Yeah, it's it's pretty common. Every, people people feel that way. It's um, it's a little bit like how do you know you need therapy when you finally recognize you got a problem? <laughs> um, so you know, sometimes it's it, it, it's it can be a little bit enlightening. Only way I learned, by the way, of how to stop doing demo crimes is to have a little voice in my head that goes, oh, "Bob, you're data dumping here." And, it was funny because my uh, my boss at the time was really hard on me, like hard on everybody. Um, and you know, we he would make us do practice demos, and he would just rip us. You know, <laughs> um, obviously, no one does that. Not many people do that anymore. And so he would then be in live demos, and he'd see me pause. Like I'd be in the middle of a demo topic, and he'd see me pause. And afterward, he'd go, "Why?" why did you have that long pause there? And I said, cause I was catching myself data dumping, you know, <laughs> um, when you, when you can kind of hear in your voice that you're, you're committing a crime, that's when you start breaking the habits. That was a long answer to your question, Madeline. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was good. Thank you. Yeah. I think I need the, I need the internal voice about the, uh, the uh, don't educate you know the you know demo don't teach kind of I, I forget exactly what it's called but basically mm -hmm. like I love to to teach people how to use the product and that's my biggest Achilles heel like st you know stop <laughs> you don't you're not a teacher you know you're a, you're a you're a salesperson absolutely that's a challenging <laughs> crime too because I think probably everybody on the call would would say yet there are times where you need to teach hmm. you know like there's there's definitely a balance where you have you do have to go um, a little bit into teaching mode, in particular if it's an area of the software that's so that's somewhat groundbreaking. And so, unless they understand a little bit behind it, they're not going to understand how it's all interconnected. It's just that you got you can't spend too much time there. I always knew when when people were going into teaching mode when the when they went up to the whiteboard and started started drawing a bunch of diagrams, it's like, <laughs> oh boy, here we go. <laughs> so yeah, that's a hard one. Steve, you have your hand up, or you did, or you do. There you go. I do. I, Bob, I'm real interested in in. Can you give us an example of the storytelling crime? Uh, I'm trying to oh, trying yeah. to imagine one, and I'm I'm fascinated by that concept. Uh, one of them we call the 90 second crime. Okay. 
stories are great. Take a, take a longer form story. So assume it's a story where you're opening up an entire uh, segment of the demo. Okay? So you're going to be in there for 45 minutes, say. So you want to use a story to open up, create an illustration, you know, to, to open up. You need to get to the point, like make a connection between the story and them within 90 seconds. Otherwise, it's kind of like, is there a point to what Steve's doing here? You know, like the, 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 the people get frustrated. And it's when we teach storytelling, uh, what happens is people get, and we want them to, they get a little wrapped up in their story and they get wrapped up in all the details of the story and the background of it. And it's two and a half, three minutes until they go. And that reminds me of your situation, right? So the classic example, right? You got to get um, to the point within 90 seconds. Personally, I like it within 60 seconds, but I, uh, I got debated and overruled by the team. So, <laughs> so I acquiesced to 90, but um, that's a classic example of a storytelling crime. So is it safe to, I mean, to categorize that most of the demo crimes are really crimes of irrelevance, that you're not being relevant to the needs of the customer? So just, just like that story crime you described. Oh, I think that's definitely a, uh, a, a pretty common thread or symptom in there because the moment you start going into the PowerPoint crutch, for example, and you just start going through and skipping slides or there's, there's 18 bullets on the slide or there's this big diagram and somebody says, um, I know this is an eye chart, but like, well, then why are you showing it if it's an eye chart? Nobody can see it. Nobody can get it. Right. You're just like you said that there's a disconnect at that at that moment with the uh, with the audience. And That's then, one of my absolute favorites is when somebody puts a PowerPoint slide up that has like has loads of text on it. And they say, well, you know, I don't expect you to read all that. But the point I'm making is this <laughs> like, OK, so why is it there then? Why did you write it out? I don't understand the point of this at all. Like, yeah, it's a classic. Yeah, like a quick tip. Um, if you want to use a quote from a case study or a quote from a, a successful customer, okay, don't put on the slide um, all the background about the company and everything else um, and then have this elongated quote and you kind of jump around in the quote to make the point because their attention is totally divided. Like, do I read the slide? Because some people want to read the slide then. You no, know, they won't hear a word you're saying on the quote. So if, if the emphasis is something that a customer said, so you really want to make an emphasis on the quote, here's, here's my technique. The first thing that pops up, just have a slide that builds, okay? First thing that pops up is the person's name and their company. So you can give credit to who it is, right? Then you pull the quote up and you read the quote word for word out loud. It's the only time in history I'll say read a slide word for word, okay? Read it word for word. Now, if you practice it and you read it word for word and, you're, and you kind of feel like it's too long, it's too long. Shorten the quote, you know, dot, dot, dot it, you know. But you read it word for word because then it'll, it'll actually penetrate their brain and they'll remember it. And then if there's any emphasis words that you, that you really want to put punch in, this gets into our storytelling techniques, right? creating some punch on, on a couple of words, make the font on those bigger, bolder, and a different color, right? And now you kind of have a little cue as you read it where you want to put the emphasis. So classic example of, of a quote, I, I get a kick out of case study slides that has like everything about the company and don't do that. Just what's relevant, like you said, Steve, what's relevant to the customer, the moment it goes into a lot of superfluous information, they don't care anymore and they won't remember it. Yeah, I think a pretty common theme for, for us is simplify. Simplify your slides, simplify your demos, simplify your benefit statements, simplify your values. And then they pick you because you're simple, not in a 
insulting way, but the solution is, you know, this is a no brainer. It's simple. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's so true, especially in the pre-sales world, you learn so much about your own product and you want to convey so much of the information about all of the great things that the, the, the software can do, but you have to remember what it's like to see it for the first time and, you know, keep, you know, keep it simple, stupid, right? Like you have to make sure it's, it's simple and objectively easy to understand, which mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know how anybody else thinks, but that's a, a guiding principle. Try and keep things looking simple. Less is more. You know, don't show, don't show so much. Uh, Sean, go ahead. So, is there such a thing as too simple? Um, I, I once had a mentor explain to me that we should be dumbing it down. You know, explain it like you would to your grandmother. That way, the client has something to take back, and it's something that they can translate to the to whoever they need to. So, is there such a thing as too simple? Oh, I, I think there definitely is in the sense that, I mean, if you're up against a, a, a really challenging competitor and there are a couple of things that you know you need to get out that are relevant, you know, not, some things are relevant, don't, don't show it, but you want to put some emphasis around that, that's a place where during the demo, um, you go into that particular area you show it and then you engage the audience in a discussion about it. It's not that you're, you're not making it simple. We, the way you demo it sh should look simple. You, know, you always want things to look easy to use, um, but you want them to kind of taste all the flavors that, uh, that are in it, you know, give them a little bit more depth to it and put a little bit more emphasis, which by the way, doesn't have to be a differentiating feature. It could be a, uh, an area of the software that you know is really important to them that everybody has, but you spend some time on it um, to make sure that they really appreciate how you're going to solve this area or provide a really good solution to it rather than being matter of fact about it. It's, it's interesting uh, as software develops over time, it, it naturally gets more and more functionality and complexity to it. And in pre-sales, it's really easy to start to move on to things that that people loved for years. You know, like they, they love this area of the software, but it's not really hot and new and all that anymore, but it's real connecting with the audience. Man, stay with it. It, it, it still works. Yeah, great advice, great advice. Um, one of the things that I really found from the book, which I thought was great, is that obviously it's not just aimed at people who are new to pre-sales, it's aimed at people who are experienced pre-sellers as well, maybe you know even more so. So I guess, um, what are the big takeaways that you would want people to, to have if they're new to pre-sales, you know, I think some of the people on the call probably uh, new or relatively new to pre-sales versus people who are experienced, you know, in the, in the industry. Um, are they different? Are they the same? Like how, what are the takeaways for, for those two audiences? Yeah. Um, I would say for new audiences form the right habits early. Uh, it's a good example of how things have gotten more complex over time, but you go back to the, to the basics. The basics are tell, show, tell. They were 20 years ago. They are today. They will be 20 years from now. Um, that just doesn't change. It is so important in particular to set the context of what you're about to show before you show it. Um, and then give it, a natural benefit at the end of that. The, so an opening tell show the software and a closing tell and to have a sense of timing in that for new people, it's really important to form that habit. Um, if, and if they form that habit, then they can build upon those skills as they go forward. I find a lot of veterans have to, a lot of them have to break a little bit of a habit of not doing the opening context. Because they're so, you know how it is, you get really familiar with the software and it start, you start to go a little bit faster. Um, 
because you've shown this particular area so many times. But if the audience has never seen it before and, and there's no opening tell, there's no context before some software starts happening, their whole mind, it, the audience's mind is catching up all the time. So it, it's just a different way to look at it for somebody who's new versus somebody who's a veteran, you know? Um, I think what veterans learn to do much better than somebody who's new and they get a lot more out of it is some of the things we teach from an agility standpoint. Because you know how it is when you're new, you're trying to learn the software, you're trying to learn the career, um, how to read a room, how to read... Um, uh, the situation with the teamwork, with the AE, all those things that when you're a veteran, you're kind of, you know, you're, you're getting that already. Um, so there's a lot for new people. And then when you throw in a lot of surprises and being agile in the middle of a demo and taking that pause when they say, can you show me and having the discipline to ask a couple of questions about it before you go and show it, that's real hard for new, newer people because they feel a lot of pressure that they need to show their now, you know, prove that they have knowledge and show the software. Veterans are a lot better at agility. Um, and when we show a few of the techniques for agility, it works pretty good. Did that, did that answer your question? Yeah, no, I, definitely. Yeah. I think, you know, the, I tell sure tell it worked 20 years ago, it works today, it'll work in 20 years time. <laughs> like it's just a fundamental. That's what I meant when I said, you know, my first question. Um, there are certain things in the book which are just fundamental, and I, I don't think they'll ever change really. Um, but I think it's interesting that you talk about, yeah, more experienced people having more agility or having the ability to have more agility just because they they know the subject matter uh, much better, I would say. Well, here's another one. Um a lot of us advocate showing the last thing first, right? We call it end of the story first, um, where you show what you believe is going to be most differentiating, relevant, and really effective uh, on the front end of the demo, okay? Mm -hmm. What veterans also recognize, though, is you, there are times where you don't want to do that. And here's what I mean you've got an executive that comes in the room and the executive is in um, amiable mode or they're in, we, we call them modes, right? A different mode that an executive is in instead of a persona, but they're in amiable mode um, or they're in expressive mode. You know, they want to talk a little bit, engaging in a little bit of conversation to them and addressing then their value of, of what they see is the reason uh, for this particular demo and bringing that up front rather than going right into software, that's going to be really effective if the executive is in the room. So veterans know how to read those situations um, and, and change it up a little bit, you know, those subtleties that become really important uh, for, for really capturing the entire audience. Veterans are really good at recognizing the different types of people in the room, the, you know, the individual stakeholders versus the managers versus the executives in directing benefits in almost a personable way at the different people. So not, not at the audience anymore. It's a little bit more at the individuals that are in the room and, you know, over to the executive. Um, and one of the reasons they get, you guys are, or the veterans on the call are, are good at that is because you already have the knowledge and the, and the experience and everything else to do the basics. So that's something where we put emphasis when we train. Absolutely. But I guess it's also important not to, not to gloss over or forget the basics sometimes. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. people need a level of foundational knowledge uh, in order to appreciate you know, the, the subtleties of the things which are directed specifically at them. I mean, if it's a new technology, a new category, a new area, sometimes people need that base knowledge. If it's a, if it's a category which has been around for a long time, like maybe CRM or, or ERP, you know, it's, it's people know what those systems are designed to do. Whereas if you're trying to sell something which is pretty cutting edge, it must be a little different, I guess. Yeah, and in, um, in our latest book that my partner and I wrote, Rule of 24, 
we put a lot more energy into the broader sales events themselves, you know, the, uh, the whole process and more into some of the technology like video automation. So, Mm. um, to build, for example, to build foundation for a demo, why not send them a vidyard or a consensus video or set of videos ahead of time to the, to the selection team that says, Hey, watch these overviews. Uh, first, it'll, it'll take you through how the, the, the basics of, or the, the fundamental elements of the software and the navigation of it so that our time together can be focused on the things that are most important to you in this session. Okay. And then you get stats that shows that they watched it. And then you show up at the demo and the majority of the room is already r- real well prepared. So the navigation and all that you can, for the most part, skip it. How great would yeah. it be to do the company overview in that too? And then you don't even have to do a company overview. Not that you know, <laughs> yeah, that'd, that'd be pretty great. But, um, you know, using leveraging some of that technology to, you know, part of that is, is that's what the buyers want too. They, you know, they want to get right to it. Mm, absolutely. That helps you get right to it. Uh, Joseph, go ahead. Hey, thanks for, uh, thanks for picking that up. Um, Bob, I, I took your training and uh, read both of those books. And I think that really resonated for me because if you're not sending those personalized videos, they're getting it anyway from YouTube or from some other source and often getting skewed information. Yeah. So you might as well not risk that particular outcome. And that also goes back to the very first question around discovery. Personally, if I am looking for discovery on a product or some solution out there, I'm going and I'm Googling it mm-hmm. and I'm not going through an entire sales process. And people have that expectation for enterprise software now as well at some level. Yeah, um, it'd be an interesting exercise for everybody on the call. If you haven't done it already, uh, when you get done with this uh, meeting, if you've got just a few minutes, go on YouTube and put in the name of of your software or the area of your software. Um, like if you're a bigger company and you got a, a bunch of, of divisions, right? The software that you normally demo. Put the name of that in there and put the word demo. And it, for a lot of you, it'll blow your mind what comes back. It's like, oh my gosh, really? Like some partner in Yugoslavia put a demo together for 34 minutes. It's four years old. And that's potentially what people are watching to self-educate. And you just go, what? You know, and it's all, it's completely inaccurate. It's, it's a bad demo and all that type of thing. Or... It's some cute little cartoony explainer video with, you know, people dancing across the screen and, you know, here's all the value and all that. And it showed nothing. You know, that's really frustrating if somebody wants to see a demo. So if you can, like Joseph said, take a little bit of control of that and direct them a little bit with, here's what I want you to watch ahead of the demo. And you throw a little personal video on the front end of it that introduces you. You also get a little star power when you show up in, in person or on the virtual meeting. Oh yeah, we saw you in video ahead of the ahead of the session. It works really good. I mean, it's it's a great technique. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a takeaway. I'm gonna I'm gonna take out of this is the uh, the idea that you know you need to control that narrative. People are gonna find a way to research your company anyway, even if you've locked everything on your website. I mean, people are gonna people are gonna do it anyway you may as well control the narrative rather than letting them find it on their own, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Matthew, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Bob. So this has been even beyond my reading in the book, the talk today about self-educating and dealing with that in a demo has been really eye-opening. Um, my question then is, 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 who really is best situated to take ownership of your audience having self-educated? Is that a marketing concern? Is that a account uh, executive concern? Is that one for all of us? What's the best strategy there in walking into a self-educated audience? Well, I'll tell you, we, um, 
we have had a lot of experience in this area. We actually had a little startup that we we ran. We we pulled the plug on it because there's really good solutions out there that were better than ours. But um, for for video automation, and we were we continue to help clients with this particular topic, right? Putting together videos that help um, their clients self educate. They come in a lot of categories, but to, to l- let me just simplify it for for all of us specifically as it relates to this audience, um, having a demo video and an imp- demo videos, I should say, and impact videos, okay? Demo video being, it's a topic, it's three minutes long, it hits on the navigation of the software or some area of the software that you want them to watch ahead of a demo, okay? Or to help self- self-educate on how something in the, de- in the software works. Don't let marketing do those. They don't have the, the, um, the industry expertise. They don't have the software expertise and they will blow a budget out of the water and what they'll spend on it. Like they'll put all this money into the bumpers and um, they'll want music in the background. And like the, these demo videos need to be authentic and they need to be done by you guys. Now, that said, there's a whole production aspect of that. And um, we work pretty hard to make production of that for our clients really simple. And there's, I put together our entire formula um, in rule of 24 of how to build those, those videos. It's real simple. Um, you do the opening tell, if you will, on, and just turn the camera on and you're on camera, Matthew. Like you give the opening context, here's what you're about to see. You know, or here's the situation. This is what the demo is going to be about. Then you record the demo. Then you come back on camera and provide the benefit. Okay. You probably want to put the benefit on the front end too, because it's a video and they can click off of it if they don't see a benefit in it in the front end. And then there's, you know, there's some subtleties in between. And like I said, the whole formula is, um, we provide the whole formula. You guys need to do those. Impact videos are a little bit more value-based. So it's a little bit more of the whole topic area of this section of the software. Um, what are the impacts it'll have on the different types of businesses? And you might have several impact videos. That you should do in conjunction with marketing because it's, it's a little bit more messaging. So the software sort of plays a background role in those. Like you'll show some software screens, but it's not really a demo. It's just showing a little bit of flow of the software just so they can get an idea. Um, Whereas a demo video, the focus is the software, you know, if that makes sense. So um, there's definitely formulas to doing this and it works. I'm telling you, it works really good. Uh, I, I, I would tell you our company, we rarely do a presentation anymore. Um, All of our, all the videos that we do that, go through the workshop highlights It provide, we go into a little bit of depth of what's in a workshop, whether it's storytelling or the demo to win or um, winning with executives or any of them and clients eat it up. They love it. It's like it's even better to them than a written document. It really gives them a, a sense of, of what they're going to get out of the solution. So don't underestimate the power of those things. They work really good. And then your demo just puts an exclamation on all the differentiators or all the unique aspects of it. That is really helpful. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. As, yeah, that, that is really interesting. I think this is a great topic and I think it's pretty hot in the pre-sales world right now is about how to use demo automation, how to use video, how to, how to engage people prior to an in-person meeting and uh, all of that sort of stuff. I know it's a big topic in our company. I'm sure it is everywhere. Yeah, we entered into partnerships with both Consensus and Video for that reason. I mean, it, it, it's just a, it's a natural, um, you know, natural technique and, and automation that go together really nicely. What do you, Bob, what do you think is, uh, is driving that change? I mean, is it that people just, their expectations and the way that they buy has completely changed oh, or yeah. is it all is it also about the software itself though because i think sometimes when you, when we're talking in the era of SaaS and things becoming a lot more user friendly and you know ux design is now this hugely important area of software 
Um, and there's the you know proliferation of, 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 of smartphones and apps and everything being at your fingertips. I mean, what do you think is driving that? Oh, I, I no doubt in my mind, it's personal behaviors. Um, how do it, if, if I were to, to say, hey, when you guys are done with this call, I want you to figure out how to um, drop the garbage disposal underneath your sink and replace it with a new one. Where, where would you go? Okay, most of you will call a plumber and I get that. But if you nah, had to do it yourself. Straight to YouTube, straight to YouTube, YouTube, everything. Or, you know, and, and TikTok has stuff on it too, right? Yeah. We're gonna, we're, personal behaviors are, uh, drive so much of this, of, of self-educating. If you're going to compare products, if you're going to, you know, that's what we do. So why would we think, well, we're, we're different, we're special because we have, you know, enterprise software. We, have, you know, they, they really want to talk to us and they want to engage in discovery with us and they want to go through elongated sales process. In fact, they want to have four meetings with a salesperson before they see anything. Right? No, it, that's why we're we're starting to train a lot of biz dev teams and salespeople on demo, not because they're people are trying to replace pre-sales at all, but because that's what the market wants. That's what we need to do. So, the nice part about demo automation and putting good video demos together is you don't have variability between one person and another. Um, and you know, it can be done really quickly. Um, the other side of it is you lose the personal aspect of it. So it's gotta be a balance. Um, mm. No, completely. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a very interesting and I'm sure it's a topic that will kind of run and run for sure. Uh, I wanted to maybe end on one, uh, kind of question that I had, which is, you know, you're, you're now the author of, of two books, actually, not just, not just demo to win, but rule 24. And, um, I'm always interested in like the, the authoring process, the writing ah. process, you know, if there's, if there's some budding authors on the call who maybe in the future think about writing a book or, or, or even just writing short form content for like blogs or, or what have you, um, what's your advice? What kind of, uh, you know, what kind of, uh, wisdom can you give us on that, on that area? Well, I, it is an arduous process. There's no doubt. Um, when I wrote demonstrating to win, what was interesting is because I wrote this kind of wrote a, a training course, you know, I, I essentially I did it all in PowerPoint that ended up being in a lot of ways, the outline for the book, you know? Um, and I don't know, it's part of how I, how I came through schooling and everything else. And, and I was never a writer. Um, but I did know and was trained that, um, and taught that you really should have an outline. So going to word or into PowerPoint, going to outline mode, what are the major topics you want to hit on? And then just start, don't even write, just start working on an outline and then you can write in between the outline and then the whole out outline will, will get blown up. That's just reality. Um, but that kind of gets you started, you know? Um, mm. there's, a, there's also an amazing software product called Grammarly. <laughs> uh, it's amazing how bad of a writer I am because it tells me all the time uh, of how I'm being passive in this sentence. You as, know? A nice, as a nice little segue, I've seen their advert on YouTube. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, using tools like that really helps. Plus, uh, voice to text works really good anymore, by the way. Mm. Uh, the, uh, when I do the revision, I'll use voice to text a lot. I, I also believe in getting away. Um, it's really hard in your job to say, well, in the evenings, I'm going to write for two hours or you got to be really fresh minded. So it's got to be first thing in the morning or you go away and you just bury yourself for a week, which is hard to do. And I get that, but it's the best way to do it. Hmm. It's interesting that you sort of create the outline first and then work on the outline and flesh it out from there, it, it, you know, because that isn't the way that you read the book. You re I mean, you read it from right. cover to cover, right? 
or, or, or actually maybe, you know, you could, uh, once you've read it cover to cover, you probably dive back in as a, as a reference material, but you know, that's not the way. So it's kind of interesting that you, you don't write, write it the way that you read it in a way. You have well, to have the structure around it. There, there are, there are a lot of, um, I'll call them experts, you know, uh, that the coach on writing that just say, just start writing. Um, for me, I find that frustrating because when I just start writing, I end up rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and I, you know, and I, I wander too much um, and I go into too many tangents and then, then the whole process kind of, for me, becomes frustrating. So I, I've learned I have to sort of put myself into, into containers <laughs> <laughs> um, and stay focused it's part of my demo crime right i've uh finished that thought so <laughs> maybe you could write a, a writing crimes at some point i don't know uh, yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that's really interesting just to, just to hear uh, you know a bit of, about the kind of creative process and the way in which things are, are done um i'm sure that other people have different ways right but i think it's interesting to hear like how you how you put yours together so that was really interesting um, a plug for a book that's coming out. Um, Patrick Pissang out of uh, Germany uh, mm -hmm. is about to release a book, I think in probably the next month or two. Um, I've got his, his initial copy for reading, but um, it's called The Social SE. And um, the little bit I've read so far, I haven't gotten too far into it, but I think it's a pretty good book. I, it's going to be worth reading. Hey, that's fantastic we yeah. love a good book recommendation in this group let me tell you that's fantastic yeah thank yeah. you very much yeah I, I think i saw a post today that he's projecting it'll be out by the end of august so uh, maybe that can be our uh, our next book after our next book david <laughs> yeah maybe why not absolutely um okay we're five minutes from time but i always like to try and give people a few minutes back in this era of back-to-back -back Zoom calls and web meetings. So thank you very much, Bob. We really appreciate yeah. your time. Uh, it was a really fun conversation. And yeah, just to hear from the author of, you know, the book we've been reading was uh, was fantastic. Thank you so much. Much hey, appreciated. It, it, tr it, it truly is always my honor to get to do these kind of things. It's uh, it's humbling um, that people want to hear what you want to have to say. So <laughs> um, it's absolutely. great to do these things. It really is. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just one final announcement before, before we wrap up, which is uh, what is going to be the next book. So uh, we have decided to kind of go on a little, a little bit of a tangent uh, to do a, a slightly different, uh, more uh, general business focused book, although it is a book specifically about sales. Um, and it's called The Introvert's Edge by Matthew Pollard. And the tagline is how the quiet and shy can outsell anyone. So I have this hypothesis that uh, the pre-sales people tend to be more introverted than extroverted, but if you're a fantastic extrovert, I still think this is going to be worth your time. Uh, it's, it's not like you have to be an introvert to read it. Um, we'll obviously post this and do some announcements on, uh, on the Slack channels and various things, but the registration link will be up in the next few days. And obviously, just a reminder to everybody, I'm sure everybody on this call is already, but uh, you can connect with us and share uh, tips and books and all the rest of it on our Slack channel, Social Pre-Sales Book Club. Um, so yeah, thank you once again, Bob. Thank you everybody for joining. It's much appreciated. You know, this community is only as good as uh, all of its members participating and having great conversations like this. So thank you very much for everybody's time. Have a good rest of your day. Yeah, have a great rest of your week, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers, everybody.